Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we still looks like people are joining, so we'll get started in just a moment. Okay, let's just go ahead and get started in interest of everyone's time. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Jenny Kean. I am Rila's Senior Executive Vice President for Member Services, and I'm really excited to welcome you all with us this afternoon. This is the fifth in our Retail Asset Protection webinar series. And as I think you all know, this is content originally developed for our AP conference that was supposed to be held back in May. Uh, we were really disappointed that we couldn't be with you in person, but excited that we're now able to share some of this content to a wider group, wider um, than those who would have been able to attend the conference. So again, thank you for being here. Before we get started, just a little housekeeping. First, our antitrust statement. So RELA always operates by both the letter and the spirit of all antitrust laws. Our content today has already been reviewed and we posted our full antitrust policy statement in the chat box if you have any interest. So please stop us if you have any concerns and we can get legal advice, but we should be good to go today, I think from an antitrust perspective. Second, uh, I do wanna issue a challenge to the retailers on the call today. Um, as you may know, we are already beginning to plan for our asset protection conference that will be held next April. It will be here in Washington, DC, where I am today. Um, and we're looking for content. So our call for proposals is already open. We always have great companies step up every year, lots of retailers, willingness to share. And I think if there's one thing that we've learned during all of our COVID-19 activities is it's that the sharing between companies like yours, like all of you who are on the call today is what really makes RELA special and makes our conference really unique and different. So please consider uh, thinking about who are the good speakers at your company, what are the great stories you might be able to share and consider putting in a, a proposal topic. And that's my pitch for today. So really happy to have with us today our speakers and to introduce our speaker today is Nadine Lejeune. Nadine is the Director of Business Continuity with Walgreens and she will introduce our speaker. Take it away, Nadine. Thank you, Jenny. Good morning and good afternoon to all of the attendees. Welcome to our session today. The session is working through the smoke, the ever-changing landscape of cannabis and how it affects the workplace. I am honored to introduce Ruth Rawls as our presenter. Ruth is a partner at Saul Ewing, Arnstein and Lair. She represents management and employment litigation matters before federal and state courts and agencies. Ruth has extensive experience litigating matters at the trial and appellate levels in state and federal court in New Jersey and New York, as well as in private mediations and arbitrations. Ruth has litigated claims arising under the New Jersey Consumer Fraud Act, the New Jersey Law Against Discrimination, and various other federal and state statutory and common law causes of action. Ruth draws on her litigation experience to counsel employers on how employment laws affect their business operations on a day-to-day -day basis. This includes advice on preventative practices to minimize workplace disputes, including accommodation and harassment issues, drafting employment agreements, and conducting internal investigations on various workplace matters. If you attended the RELA conference last year, you would remember Ruth as a presenter with a similar topic and her session was highly rated. So please welcome back Ruth to our session today. Ruth. Thank you Nadine for that wonderful introduction. And uh, for those of you that are that I'm not seeing but are coming again this year, um, I am sad that we're not in person, but I'm so excited and grateful that Rila was able to put together this fantastic webinar series. Um, so I, I did speak on this topic last year. I continue to speak on this topic because it continues to change um, every day. Um, new cases come out, new statutes come out. So it is a bit of a moving target. Um, so we're going to talk in broad brush strokes about best practices and some of the developments that have happened and why it's even an issue. So I'm going to start with my general question when I do all of these things as why should you care? So let's talk a little bit about that. We should care because medical cannabis use by employees in fact affects all aspects of employment, particularly um, in, in companies. 
It comes into play in hiring to fire and firing decisions. It can come into play with respect to drug testing policies and procedures. Um, we're dealing with on-site and off-site use, on-site possession, um, security and safety concerns arising out of that, and also training with respect to managers and supervisors, employees, and across the board. So it touches a lot of areas and part and parcel to what I will continue to say here every time is it's really important to have these discussions with your management team now, with your leadership now, so that there's a clear and consistent message in terms of how the company is going to handle issues when they arise. So continuing on my why should you care um, theme, I wanna run through some numbers with you. So if you have not had this issue pop up yet, you will have this issue pop up eventually because as this slide and the next couple of slides will tell you, the number of medical cannabis users is increasing daily um, for many reasons um, in terms of the more acceptance of it as a treatment for certain disabilities and illnesses. Um, and also because a lot more states are passing medical programs um, and some are even passing adult use programs, which is a whole nother can of worms that we'll get into in just a little bit. So in 2018, um, estimated cannabis, um, medical cannabis sales were between 3.8 and 4.5 billion with a B um, dollars in sales. Um, in 2020, that estimate is between 4.9 and 6.1. So that number is going to continue to go up. So why is that number continuing to go up? It's going to continue to go up because the number of authorized patients is going to continue to go up. So um, I think last year when I had this slide up, it was around 3 million. This year it is 4 million. Um, so that number is consistently increasing. Um, and just to give you kind of a, a snapshot of what some of the states are looking like, I just picked a couple where we've seen programs expanded um, by the state governments or have adopted programs. And you, know, you can see right here, Florida, New Jersey, New York, the, the numbers are very high. Um, and I practice in New Jersey, so I am very familiar with the program here. And we have had a program since 2010. It was extremely restricted. They expanded it, opened up the qualifying conditions. And from, within the last two years, the number of patients has went from about 12,000 to 51,000. If that gives you kind of an idea of where those numbers are, are falling out. So all of that I say because those those people that are using medical cannabis to treat underlying conditions are employees of somebody and they might likely be your employees. So it's important to understand how we're going to deal with this when it comes up. Um, here's just a handy dandy chart in various shades of green um, in light of our topic um, where it kind of gives you a lay of the land in terms of what the states look like in terms of what's passing, what's not passing. I will tell you um, we are probably going to see a lot more movement on the completely um, legalized, I say that in quotes a bit, um, because it still is federally illegal, but authorized adult use um, in light of the current pandemic because states are in desperate need of tax revenue and this is an easy way to get it. So that I think you're gonna see some movement as well. So I just said um, it's illegal. And I, I said that in quotes when I talked about legalized for states. So we start with federal law here, right? Federal law, Controlled Substances Act, doesn't recognize the difference between medical, recreational adult use. Cannabis is a Schedule I drug. It's illegal. End of story on the federal level. And, and this slide here is the reason we have a bit of an issue um, and we have a, a bit of a mishmash because we have the federal government and federal law saying one thing and then we have state laws that are saying another. So the first poll question, and if everyone can bear with us, we've, we've put in a little interaction here for everyone so that we can get a little audience participation. So if um, we can pop up the first poll question. Um, before we get into this, and I've kind of laid it out, I'd like to see yes or no, has your company received a request from an employee related to medical cannabis? So if you can just take a second to answer that, it'll be an interesting to see if my why you should care is further down the road here. Uh, than it is, uh, than I thought it might be, depending on what the answers are. All right, so I'm going to give you just a minute and let's go ahead and pop up the results if we can. Let's see what we've got. This is very interesting. All right, so we have quite a, you know, so we have about half of you have, half of you have had this issue pop up. Um, so the half of you that haven't, get ready um, because it's coming your way eventually. Um, 
But I think that's a good kind of indicator of where we are based on some of those numbers. So I'm just going to skip ahead and come back to that in a second because I want to tell you where this is coming up and probably some of the context that, that you folks said say that you have dealt with it where it's come from. So what has happened is plaintiffs in numerous states have started challenging their terminations um, or some type of adverse employment action that occurred um, for a positive cannabis test. And they are asserting that the cannabis was a treatment for their respective disability and thus under either the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act or the relevant state equivalent, um, the employers are required to accommodate their use. So just a little background there is in order to get a recommendation for medical cannabis, most state statutes have a list of debilitating conditions, qualifying conditions, you know, various names, essentially, what can you get the, a recommendation from a physician for to use medical cannabis? And I, I say recommendation for a reason. Doctors are not permitted to prescribe medical cannabis because it is a Schedule One drug, so they're offered, they have the ability to recommend it. Um, and there's usually a list of debilitating conditions. Most of those conditions, I, I, without even looking at all of them, they, they range from lists of five or six to lists that contain 60 plus um, conditions. Most of those conditions, if not all, um, will qualify as a disability under either the ADA or the state equivalent um, to, as something that affects a major life function. So the reason this is an issue is the employee is saying, I have this condition, this is a disability. This is the medication I am choosing to use to treat that, you have to accommodate me. So I'm gonna go back a slide and let's start with the ADA. So the ADA is a pretty simple answer right now. Um, current illegal drug users are not individuals with disabilities. You're not entitled to an accommodation because marijuana cannabis is a schedule one drug under the Controlled Substances Act. The, uh, the person is an, a current illegal drug user, no accommodation required. And the cases that have come out on this issue have been pretty consistent across the board. So where does that leave us? That leaves us with the state statutory language. And what's really key here is that we look at the state, the actual language in the state um, statutes, and it's in two places. We're either going to see it in the authorizing statute, meaning that the, the statutory regulatory scheme that authorizes the medical cannabis program, or we're going to see it in the state anti-discrimination statute if they have one. Um, and, and I say that because there is a difference and the cases have come out various ways in terms of whether or not an individual has a private right of action under the enabling statute, which is the statute that creates the program, and whether an individual can assert a claim underneath there. If they can't, they will usually go to the next, the next statute, or they will assert both, which is the state anti-discrimination statute. So in New Jersey, um, plaintiffs that were looking to assert these claims would look to CUMA, which is the which is the Compassionate Use Act and the amended act now, and the New Jersey Law Against Discrimination. And we'll talk about a case where they did just that. But it's the language in the authorizing statute or the language in the anti-discrimination statutes that are going to matter. And that's where courts have looked for these type of claims. So here's just a quick kind of handy dandy chart of what the authorizing statutes say. And this chart, I will say, has probably changed the most um, since I've started doing this presentation because the, the box for prohibiting discrimination used to only have three or four states in it. It now has way more than that. Um, and I think that is just a function of the court decisions that we've seen because when these statutes were initially getting passed, I don't think anybody was thinking about discrimination or anti-discrimination or what's going to happen when employees test positive for a state approved use of medical cannabis. Um, we've seen some case law come out and states have adopted, expanded their programs and they've changed this language. Um, and they've changed it for a couple of reasons. Um, they've changed it to clarify and quite frankly on the employer side, uh, lots of times when I talk to my clients, they, you know, right, wrong or indifferent, they would just like to know what they're supposed to do. Um, and if there's a statute that tells you what you can and can't do, it is much easier to make those decisions so you're not kind of rolling the dice if you potentially get sued for a decision that was made. 
As you'll see, there's also a box for explicitly allowing employers to prohibit use and intoxication. That is not a surprise. Um, we see that in almost all of the statutes and everything that we talk about today, nothing prohibits an employer from making sure that they have, that they are, have employees that are not under the influence or using medical cannabis on site. So it's a distinct issue. And when we talk about some of the cases, one of the things you'll probably hear me say is the plaintiff alleged that they, did, they were neither under the influence nor had they used um, medical cannabis at work. Um, and that's almost a key part of every pleading where there's a claim asserted. Um, Ohio is our lone holdout for states that do not prohibit discrimination. There used to be, I think, three on there. We're down to one. Um, so we'll see if Ohio changes its mind at some point. So I said I was going to talk about a couple cases. So this is Barbudo case. And for those of you that heard me last year, I talked about this case as well. And I talk about it a lot because it really was the biggie that came out. It was the first time we saw this. It was in 2017. And this really kind of marked a bit of a sea change for how courts are dealing with this issue. And Barbudo, the fact pattern in Barbudo is the fact pattern that employers were typically see when we're talking about medical cannabis. We have an individual who applies for a job, who gets a conditional job offer, and the employer says, hey, got to take a drug test. And the, and the potential employee says, that's fine, I will, but by the way, and just so you know, I am a registered card holder. I use medical cannabis to treat an underlying disability. I do not use it at work. I do not come to work under the influence. Um, it's either in the evenings or on the weekends, um, and it's my, my drug test is going to come back positive for that. And somebody says, not a problem, don't worry about it. Go ahead and start. The drug test comes back positive. And then somebody else says, oh, no, wait, that is a problem. We're revoking your job offer or we're terminating you. And there comes the claim. <coughs> In Barbudo, that's exactly what happened. We had an individual who started a job, conditional offer. She actually started working before her results came back, fully disclosed. Uh, that she was a medical cannabis user, had a card, um, provided what, and I think the underlying condition in that case was Crohn's disease, and the, someone in HR said shouldn't be an issue, don't worry about it. Uh, the test came back positive, and somebody else said, oh, nope, that's an issue. We, we are not okay with that. It's illegal under federal law. We're revoking your offer. And the, the plaintiff and the former employee filed a claim uh, for a reasonable accommodation under, as you'll see here, Massachusetts, disability discrimination law, right? So we know how we talked about those two things, right? We have the authorizing statute or the state discrimination law. This claim was filed under the state discrimination law. And most of the cases that we saw up until this date, these, these claims were being routinely dismissed. And the court here said, no, we're not dismissing it. You can proceed. And that was a big deal because these claims weren't going to go away. Um, the easy peasy from the beginning. So they were actually going to have to deal with them and determine whether or not there had to be an accommodation and what that accommodation was. And maybe that accommodation is simply exempting the individual from the drug test, depending on what their position was. So then we have this other case, which is a district court case out of Connecticut, the Knopfsinger case. And there were two motions in this case. First, we had a motion to dismiss and same almost identical fact pattern here and an individual applied for a job said hey you have to take a drug test the individual says got a test positive for marijuana cannabis i'm a registered card holder this is my disability this is why i'm using it somebody there says don't worry about it test positive and somebody else said oh we're worried about it and they would revoke the job offered now, the interesting thing about Knopfsinger is this was a federal contractor um, as opposed to a private employer. So we've all kind of always thought, oh, federal contractors are different. Not so much, um, says the district court in Connecticut. So at first, the employer argued that the federal law exemption allowed it to discriminate against this employee um, and, the, and that the state statute doesn't expressly create a right of, um, private right of action. Now, in the Connecticut case, this, this particular plaintiff was asserting claims under the anti-discrimination statute as well as the state authorizing statute. Court said, no, we're not going to dismiss it. Case can go forward. Then there was a summary judgment motion. And on summary judgment, the court found in favor of the plaintiff. And interestingly, the employer argued 
that it cannot be liable because Connecticut creates an exception to discrimination where it's required by federal law or required to obtain federal funding. And they looked to the Federal Drug Free Workplace Act and that that, that act barred it from hiring this individual. And the court rejected that argument. And it's interesting, I think this language is really important um, when we start looking at this act. You know, and what the court said is that the Drug Free Workplace Act doesn't require drug testing, nor does it prohibit federal contractors from employing someone who uses illegal drugs outside of the workplace, much less an employee who uses medical cannabis outside the workplace in accordance with the program approved by state law. So we have some commentary from the district court on the Drug Free Workplace Act dealing with the federal contractor and the plaintiff was actually entitled to damages on this claim and was awarded summary judgment on some of the counts. And then we also had a case in New Jersey, um, the Wild case. Now this case I, I put in here because it is a little different. We're not talking about a pre-employment drug test. <clears throat> in this case, we're talking about a drug test that was done while the individual was at work. So in this case, the plaintiff was working at a funeral home um, and he was undergoing chemotherapy. And as part of the palliative care that he was receiving, he had a recommendation for medical cannabis, was using it offsite, not under the influence, not bringing it to work. Um, and he was just working. And he was driving a car during the course of his employment and someone hit him, hit, I think, T-boned him in the middle of an intersection, ran through a red light. Was not this individual's fault, clearly not his fault, somebody else just hit him goes to the emergency room. The emergency room doctor is going to do a drug test. The, the plaintiff says, hey, here's my card. I'm gonna test positive. The emergency room physician says, I am making a determination that you are not under the influence and I'm not going to do a drug test. And they leave and he wants to return to work. The employer says, you can't come back until you pass a drug test. And the employee says, I have a card, I'm gonna test positive. Employer says, shouldn't be a problem. Test positive, and then he's fired for failing his drug test. So in this case, this went up fairly quickly. Uh, we had a lower court decision, appellate division decision, Supreme Court decision, and it was affirmed and it went all the way up and the court found that there was a claim that could be asserted under the New Jersey law against discrimination um, for discrimination. Um, based on his uh, use of medical cannabis to treat his underlying condition. So with those cases out there, um, and then I have another one in here. This is Pennsylvania. This is a really relatively new decision out of Pennsylvania. Um, the Pennsylvania statute is similar to New Jersey. So I have this one in here as well. Same type of fact pattern. We have an individual who was out of a company that got acquired by another company. Um, and she, they, she was required to take a drug test even though she was essentially continuing employment and they terminated her. Uh, she had been a long time employee. Now this is a trial court decision, uh, came out, it's a, out of motion to dismiss. There have been several cases filed in Pennsylvania recently on this issue. So we've been watching it closely to see if we get two different decisions or if um, a higher court in PA decides to weigh in on this particular issue. So let's talk a little bit about adult use. So, so far what I've been talking about is medical and medical is, and the reason medical cannabis is different is because it puts us into that reasonable accommodation bucket. Um, we're treating a underlying debilitating condition, a health condition, and it puts us into that kind of disability discrimination bucket of analysis. Adult use is not the same. Adult use is different. You don't have that whole analysis to go through. Um, but we're seeing a lot of states start to pass adult use legislation. There's a ballot, there's a ballot initiative in New Jersey. Um, we've seen several other states, some that are listed here. I think Illinois was probably the most recent state to pass adult use across the state. Um, and they have some interesting statutory language. Not sure that this is all gonna pass, but back to my earlier point, States need tax revenue. Nobody's gonna be all that upset if we put a really high tax on cannabis. Um, so it's a way to generate money. So you may see that also kind of moving the dial here in terms of getting the stuff passed and getting it through where we're gonna to have to deal with some of these issues. So again, not the same. We're outside of that reasonable accommodation bucket, but you still need to look at those adult use statutes. They could have language in there 
um, about what employers can and cannot do with respect to off-site um, cannabis use, even if it's not for medical use. So again, go back to the state statute, see what it says. So when you're operating in states, it's really important to understand what your obligations are. So all of that, what was one of the things that was kind of went all the way through there was drug testing. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about drug testing um, in terms of what we can look at, what are some of the developments we've seen. But before we do that, I am going to do our second poll question just to get an idea from our audience um, with respect to pre-employment drug testing. So if you could just let me know yes or no, does your company conduct pre-employment drug testing across the board for everybody? So let's give you a second to answer that um, with no dead air here. Um, so if we can pop up the results, let's see what we've got. Wow, it's almost completely split. This is very interesting. So about 50, so it's about 19, to, like, so we've got 50% um, do do pre-employment drug testing and, and a significant amount that don't. Um, so let's go to our third poll question uh, along the same line. So if you, so this is for the people that say that you do do it and, I, and I'm going to, I'm going to expand this to say pre-employment as well as incident, um, post-incident. If you do drug testing at all, does it include THC cannabis in the panel? Do you still test for it? Um, so if you guys want to answer that, I'm going to take a look at a question while we do that. Oh, somebody says they don't see the poll response. So let's go ahead and pop up this poll response. Okay, so yes, so most of you are still including it in the testing panel. We have some that are not. So it's interesting. Um, we are seeing, I would say, especially with respect to clients and, and contacts and, that I talk to, there is a bit of a move away from just dropping it from the panel in total. Um, and not dealing with that issue and kind of moving on and just doing it quietly. Um, most companies don't announce that, but um, we just drop it and move on. So that's really interesting to, to kind of see where everybody is on that. So let's talk about it. Why is it so hard when it comes to cannabis? Well, this is my attempt to be a scientist on this slide. I just play one on, on webinars. It's about all I know. But THC is stored in lipid fat compartments throughout the body which means that it, it hangs around for a while. So it's detectable in blood and urine for about up to a month. It's detectable in hair for much longer. So if you are consistently using medical cannabis, um, you're going to have a buildup and you're gonna test positive. Um, so if somebody is consistently using it to treat a disability, they're going to probably test positive. So it stays in the body for a long time, you're gonna test positive. So what's really the issue is we do not have an acute intoxication test for cannabis right now. By way of example, for alcohol, if we suspect somebody's under the influence of alcohol, we, we see that they look impaired, we can give them a breathalyzer right there and we can figure out under that acute intoxication test whether they're intoxicated. We think someone's impaired, they might be under the influence of cannabis, we send them off for a drug test and it comes back positive. That does not tell us if that person was impaired at that time because it stays in the body for quite some time. So I'm just gonna check you guys really quickly. I have another question. Oh, poppy seeds provided positive drug tests. Did you watch that episode of Seinfeld 2 where Elaine was testing positive? Um, I don't know the answer to that one. Um, I think you'd have to eat a lot of poppy seeds though. So let's go ahead and move on um, to whether or not employers can drug test, right? The answer here is maybe. Um, it used to be a resounding yes, um, but now it's a bit of a maybe, and I'll, and I'll get into why um, we're seeing a change there. So you should conform all of your drug testing policies and procedures um, to conform with state law um, with respect to what you can and cannot test for. Some of these medical cannabis statutes have said um, you can't test for this, you can't test for that, when you can test, what you can do. Um, it's interesting in, in New Jersey, I'll just talk a little bit about that because I'm very familiar with it. They, they almost um, baked in a little bit of the reasonable accommodation interactive process into the, into the statute um, where you can drug test, but if someone comes back with a positive uh, test for cannabis, then you have to give them three days to provide you with um, the reason 
a permissible reason for that to be positive. If they give you a medical card, um, that, is, that is sufficient. Uh, so they, they put that process in there that employees have to provide. <clears throat> so for states like that, we want to make sure that we have that type of policy that's reflective of what the statute requires. Um, depends on when the drug test is required, pre-employment versus post-incident. Post-incident, we have some OSHA stuff we have to deal with. Um, but you know, you know, just doing them as a matter of course, we have to be careful about how we're doing that. Also depends on who's being tested and why. Um, random drug tests, you know, some states don't permit those anymore. Um, and you know, I, I urge caution when anybody's dealing with those. So let's talk about, and I see the question on DOT, and I'm going to get to that in just a second. Um, but let's talk about why that yes turned into a maybe. Um, New York City, not New York State, but New York City um, passed a city ordinance um, that prohibits testing for cannabis. Uh, there are except that happened in um, April 9th of 2019. I believe it just went into effect this year, gave everybody some time to get ramped up for that. You can't test for cannabis for drug applicants. There are exceptions, clearly. And this goes to the question that just popped up in the Q&A um, that deals with you know, specific job positions. I think the one that was raised there was um, DOT regulated positions um, where you're talking about federal regulations, which are different. But here, even when we have state prohibitions, um, we do have exceptions. And I've listed what some of those are. Some of them aren't too surprising, right? Police officers, CDL drivers, um, individuals that supervise kids, medical professionals, things like that. Um, there are employees of federal contractors and federally um, preempted positions, which really are gonna be your DOT positions where you are specifically required by the federal government um, to drug test for everything, including cannabis. Um, this also has an exemption for CBA. So if the CBA is um, addressed pre-employment drug testing, tribute, CBA is gonna control. Um, again, the last bullet point here is the one that I think is really important is that not, still nothing prohibits us from taking action if we reasonably suspect someone's under the influence of marijuana or cannabis. So similar to New York City, Nevada um, also has a prohibition against testing for cannabis. Um, it's a new law that makes it unlawful for any employer to, um, in Nevada, to fail or refuse to hire a prospective employee because they submitted to drug screening and they got a test that indicated the presence of marijuana. Again, we see some exceptions here, right? The ones that we typically think we would say firefighters, emergency medical technicians, anyone that's operating a motor vehicle. Um, we have this federal law exemption type of issue here and safety sensitive positions. Um, safety sensitive positions are a, a head scratcher because um, a lot of times we see that, but there's really no definition of what that is or what positions there are that um, would qualify for safety sensitive. Um, I, I have seen some movement away from just that general prohibition based on this concept of, well, that's fine, but as long as they're not under the influence of work at, at work, why do we care? Um, I still think you're going to see safety sensitive positions exempted in some of these laws, um, but you never know. And I will tell you, I think that the reason Nevada and the reason New York City have um, passed ordinances and statutes like this is because Nevada has adult use. It is permissible. So we have a lot more people using cannabis. Uh, New York City and well, New York does not yet, but uh, New York and New Jersey are currently in a race to see who can uh, authorize adult use first to get the biggest market share. So I think they're preparing for this inevitable type thing. I haven't seen any other action from other states, but it wouldn't surprise me um, if we see more of this. And um, again, most of them include, similar to this one here, um, an exception for CBAs or collectively bargained agreements. That's gonna trump the new law. So to the question that was asked for federal law and drug testing, federal contractors and transportation, nuclear, and defense employers are subject to federal drug testing laws. And there's a difference between being covered by the Drug-Free Workplace Act, which covers most federal employers, versus 
requirements for drug testing under these physicians. So I just want to make that distinction clear when we were talking about that Knopfinger case in the District of Connecticut and what the court said, they were saying that the, the Drug Free Wor Workplace Act cannot be this generalized shield that requires you to drug test people. That's not what it says. But the difference here is that transportation, nuclear defense employees are required to be drug tested under certain programs and that is different. Um, that is a actual federal requirement for drug testing. So that's always going to, to, to trump that issue. Um, there's usually a two-step program. Um, they screen for very specific things um, and you're subject to all the bells and whistles that go along with federal drug testing. Um, so if that's, and I don't believe any of us are probably covered by that, but um, it's out there to be aware of. That's where we really are gonna have to follow federal law. So just, we've been talking a little bit about pre-employment drug testing, what states are doing. Let's talk about during employment, because that's come up twice. Well, it's come up once in the Knopfinger case, right, where we were, had someone that was tested while they were at work. Um, there's another case that really speaks to this, which is the Whitmore um, versus Walmart stores case. This came out of Arizona uh, relatively recently. And this was a during employment post-incident drug test where we had an individual that was injured at work, left and as a condition to come back, had to take a drug test and pass it. Um, and they found it, they, that person tested positive for marijuana. Uh, the, the thing that came out of that case, I'm just gonna see if it's, yeah, it's my next slide, is what I would like to put on a bumper sticker is that presence does not equal impairment, right? So the mere presence of cannabis in someone's system does not mean that they were impaired at the time. So if you guys will go back to those slides where I was pretending to be a scientist and tell you why THC testing was difficult, this is really the answer to that because we do not have an acute intoxication test. And just because cannabis is present in someone's system, that's not in and of itself enough to demonstrate the person was impaired. So what are we gonna do? Well, don't worry, we have the same tools we have always had at our disposal to determine whether there's impairment. And we can document that impairment and that's going to get us hopefully over the hump if we really have an issue. Um, based on where this case was at the time, the court said, I can't, there's nothing else in here other than this positive test to say that there was impairment. So we're not going to reach that determination here. And they ruled in favor of the plaintiff. So let's just talk briefly about policies here. Um, you know, we want, we can establish a drug free workplace, but let's just remember what that means. That means a drug free workplace that we are, you know, we're not, we can't dictate what people are doing outside of the workplace, um, depending on the states that we're in. Um, we have to be really careful about how we're dealing with that. Um, we may have to accommodate offsite use um, as a reasonable accommodation, depending on what our state law says. On-site use, totally different issue. Um, we're just talking about off-site use here. You have to be really careful about discriminating. Um, we make sure that our policy includes whatever accommodation language we need in those state statutes. So if you remember me talking about that New Jersey statute, um, I redrafted a lot of policies for employers in New Jersey to basically parrot the language out of that statute that said, this is what you get. Here's your three day notice. This is what the letter looks like. You gotta give me this. And we made sure that we, we did that. So it's not a huge lift, but it's just things you have to kind of keep track of and make sure um, folks are aware of. So back to my whole presence doesn't equal impairment um, lecture and the fact that we still have the tools we've always had. Um, we should really make sure that we're training our supervisors and managers in detecting current intoxication. That could take various forms. That could be a cheat or checking boxes. Two people sign off on it. They're saying what they, they recognize, what, what they're seeing. Um, and that may in and of itself be enough to justify a adverse employment action, discipline, termination, depending on the situation. So one thing that I do think is helpful here, and um, when Illinois passed its adult use statute um, and some of the things, it's one of the first statutory schemes that I've seen that actually talks about impairment and talks about the things that we can look at and that we can use and that we can write down to tell us and support a determination that an employee was impaired. Um, so what I included the, the language from it that says an employer may consider an employee to be impaired or under the influence of cannabis if the employer has a good faith belief 
that the employer manifests specific articulable symptoms while working that decrease or lessen the employee's performance, including symptoms of speech, physical dexterity, agility, coordination, demeanor, irrational, unusual behavior, or negligence or carelessness in operating equipment. So I find this statute to be helpful to give us a little direction of what is impairment as it relates to cannabis and what at least one state has recognized um, in their statutes that we could potentially use in terms of what we're looking at. So let's just talk briefly um, about on-site use. Nothing's changed there, folks. We're not gonna have to let people uh, come to work uh, under the influence. Um, we can prohibit employees from using cannabis in the workplace during work hours. We can prohibit employees from being under the influence. Um, the challenge again is going to be identifying those employees who are under the influence at the time. So let's talk a bit about on-site possession. And I have a case in here that I find very interesting. Um, it's just a complaint right now, but it's, uh, it's an interesting kind of fact pattern. So we can prohibit the possession of cannabis at work. We can prohibit distribution manufacture of cannabis at work. Um, and we can tell employees they can't store um, cannabis in their lockers, what have you. It's a safety issue. It's a theft issue. So this case that I just stuck in here at the bottom is fairly recent. It just got fired in, or fired, filed in Pennsylvania, um, this Hesh case. So what happened in this case is we had an employee, this is what she alleges. So let me, let me couch all of this in. This is what's alleged in the complaint. So I make no, no judgment as to what's true, what's not true, or what the employer's side of the story is. But this is what the employee alleges in the complaint is that um, she is a medical cannabis user. Uh, she does not use cannabis at work. She does not come to work under the influence. Uh, she does not bring it with her or store it anywhere at work. Um, she was in the office. Um, she had her bag with her and she was going through it to clean it out and she threw a bunch of stuff away. Uh, one of the things she threw away was a box, an empty box that contained um, cannabis. Uh, I, and it has a label in there. I think it was, I can't remember which company it was, but it was, uh, I think, probably gummies or tablets or something. Um, and she threw that box away in the trash can at work. I think a receipt as well. Um, and somewhere along the line, somebody saw that in the garbage. They called her in and asked her about it. And said, you know, were you using this in the office? Were you, were you using this at work? And her answers were no, no, no. And they, they said, we'll get back in contact with you. Um, and they, she was ultimately terminated for violating their policies. Was, and she says it was never made clear to her about what that was. So I, I find that to be an interesting kind of wrinkle in this on-site possession, on-site use type of issue um, with respect to medical cannabis, right? So it, it creates, when I read, I was like, oh, wow, I don't know what I would do there. Um, I haven't had that issue pop up. Um, you know, I think that case might boil down to credibility determinations, but it is an uh, interesting kind of factual development with respect to cannabis in the workplace. So with that, I have my kind of general disclaimer on the fact that all of this stuff continues to change. Um, it might be different tomorrow. We may see some different cases coming out, um, but it's really important that as you're dealing with these issues to make sure that your team from, H from your frontline managers and supervisors to your HR folks, all the way up to your C-suite and your leadership are on the same page about this. Um, and one of the things that I, I frequently tell clients is you know, we're not trying to change hearts and minds here, right? So if, if folks feel one way or the other about medical cannabis and whether it's okay, not okay, legitimate, not legitimate, whatever it is, um, you know, that's fine. But you really need to make sure that you're complying with state law because if those opinions conflict with what the state statutes say, you're gonna find yourself potentially in a predicament with an employee that either fails a drug test or um, has an incident at work and fails a drug test um, and how we're gonna deal with that. And all of the cases that we talked about, I think what you also heard me say is that wasn't the case there, right? What happened in most of those cases is that we had an employee who some, you know, failed a drug test or told HR or told their manager or told somebody, hey, this is 
I'm a Canvas user, here's my card. And somebody at the company said, okay, that's fine. And then somebody else said, oh no, that's not fine. Um, and so we had a definite um, line of communication issue, um, which I think probably does influence courts to some degree of that's just not fair, right? The person disclosed, they told you, you said it was okay. And then you turn around and kind of take that back. So having a consistent message, having a consistent policy and making sure that we train people um, on what that is, is really important. Um, you know, I, I deal with a lot of HR folks, I deal with a lot of business folks. And I always say, your managers and supervisors are your last line, of, are your first line of defense, right? If it doesn't get past them, you're probably not gonna hear about it. And the big problems happen when something's happening and it doesn't make its way up yet. Um, so making sure that they understand what does need to make its way up um, and when to ask for help and guidance is really important. Um, and on the impairment side, I think it is really important to talk to your folks about how we're going to document impairment. Um, what are best practices there? Do we have two people sign off on it? If we're gonna make an adverse employment decision here, we're gonna terminate somebody, let's make sure that we have our paperwork together on the back end so that if we find ourselves potentially subject to a claim, we have a really good defense to it. And we're not falling into that presence doesn't equal impairment type issue. Um, but we have separate independent visual evidence from our folks telling us what they've seen um, and what they think that the issues are. So with that, I am done a little early. Um, so we're about 10 minutes left. If anybody has any questions, I don't see um, any in here, but if anybody has any, wants to pop anything up, or if, I don't know, uh, Nadine or anybody else that really has a question, I'm happy to answer it. Um, so I'll just kind of give everybody a minute uh, if anybody wants to jump in. Do you have any hard questions for me, Nadine, while we still have to, you can ask me something really difficult that I don't know what to do before we're done. Well, you know, now I'm just thinking about the Seinfeld episode you talked about. I might have to go and <laughs> look for it. But um, I really appreciated the case, the cases that you brought up because um, I know that we've had these types of cases in the past where, you know, one aspect of our company was very well aware of what our drug and test drug testing policies were and maybe the manager of the associate or maybe even the HR rep was not very clear on it so the point that you made at the end in ensuring that everyone is aware of the company's stance and also what our procedural um, actions are in the event of a positive test is extremely important so um, hopefully all of the attendees have this in place and if not um, that is something that they should be working on. There is a question that just popped up. Yes, so we have a question that says, from a risk and management perspective, there are insurance reasons to conduct post-accident drug testing. Um, do you anticipate this will change in the future? Um, I don't, I mean, look, I think you're going to, let me just close this, uh, continue to have post-incident drug testing. I think you have to be careful about that, right? There has to be a reason to do it. We can't just kind of do it as a knee-jerk reaction. I think there's been, um, don't have it in front of me, some OSHA guidance on that. Um, and they kind of went back and forth on when you can't, you can't do that, but you can do that, but you have to tell people. Um, so yes, you can do post-incident drug testing. I think two things are relevant there. If you're going to do it, um, make sure you have some type of report from someone during the incident that has somehow documented what happened, what they saw. If they saw something that was impair like looked like impairment, if there was something going on there, that we have that document. And two, if the test comes back positive for cannabis, if we're testing for it, before we make a decision, before we make some type of adverse employment decision, we understand one, what does the state law say we can do here? Can we, can we just, does the statute tell us we can't just, you know, what, what is the issue? And two, does this individual have a medical card? So if we're in a state um, right now, like New Jersey, where an individual, you know, do post-incident testing, they test positive, they don't have a medical cannabis card, 
I don't think that we have an issue, right? You can make a determinate, an adverse determination decision if that person was impaired or they violate your policy because we don't fall into that reasonable accommodation bucket. However, we have post-incident testing, the person tests positive, and we're in a state like New Jersey or one of the other states we talked about where the per you go to that individual, tell them, and they say, well, here, I'm a medical cannabis user. Here's my card. Don't use it at work. Wasn't under the influence. Then what becomes really important is that first thing we talked about, right? What's our documentation look like with respect to that incident? Do we think that person was impaired at the time? Um, and do we have independent basis to make that determination or to make an adverse employment decision based on the drug test we got and the behavior that we witnessed? So I, I think you can still do it. You have to be careful about the OSHA issues, but there is, you know, let's make sure that we're documenting, documenting, documenting what's going on and that we're understanding what our obligations are under state law and what we may need to go ask that employee if we get a positive cannabis test back um, and how we can respond to that. And I see a couple more. Let's see. So the first one says, if the associate does not provide information about having a medical authorization, does this provide a remedy later on after termination? I'm not sure that I understand exactly. I think what you're asking is, if the person tests positive and they do not have medical authorization and they're terminated, um, when is that going to come into play? I think, you know, when we're in these states where we have to be careful about discriminating um, under these accommodation laws, if, they do, if we've given them the opportunity to provide us with their medical authorization and their card and they don't, um, I think they're going to be hard pressed to come back and say we failed to accommodate them later. And the next question I have is what about the increased use and acceptability of CBD products? Some of which have trace amounts of THC. This is, this is a doozy. Um, and there's been a whole bunch of guidance that's come out in terms of what THC content there can be in CBD products. Um, you know, I'm gonna go back to a really fundamental thing um, and buyer, buyer beware. When you're buying CBD products, you don't know um, if there's THC in it. You don't know what the content is. You're, you're relying on that labeling. There's very little guidance, or there was little. There's more now in terms of what that has to look like. But, you know, look, I'll come back to kind of this fundamental point. When we're talking about positive cannabis tests, in the absence of language in an adult use statute that says we can't discriminate for positive tests, we're going to always come back to was this person using it for medical purposes? If they weren't, we don't fall into that reasonable accommodation bucket. What does our policy say? And is there any legal reason that prevents us from taking action? And that's where you're going to wind up. So, you know, if you have employees that are, you know, ingesting CBD products that have THC in them, there's not a lot we can do about that. Uh, the next question I have here is, must an employee disclose acquiring a medical cannabis license after employment, say after four months already employed, how does this align with HIPAA? Um, most of the statutes I've seen do not have an affirmative obligation to disclose. Uh, the disclosure issue pops up when there is a drug testing issue. And, and, and so New Jersey statute, you don't have any, but you, you can't, as I read the statutes, require an employee to tell you if they have a medical cannabis card. There, there's no affirmative obligation to do that. But if there's a drug test and you're permitted to test for cannabis and it comes back positive, then you can ask for the card. If they give it to you, it could potentially explain the test and it could be a sufficient reason to not make, a, make an adverse employment action. Um, if they don't give you the card, you know, you, you do what you do under your policy. Um, but I don't think that you can affirmatively at this point, based on what I've seen, require employees to tell you if they have a card. I think that it, even if you did do that, you would run the risk of potentially opening yourself up to discrimination claims, meaning why are you, why are you asking that? Are you going to treat us differently? Are you going to target us? Things like that. I think it could definitely create some issues. I don't see any other ones. Does anybody, I love these webinars. Does anybody have a question they want to ask for a friend? That's usually what I get um, when, we, when we talk about this topic. I, I think that's it. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to 
Nadine, and thank you all for uh, hanging out with us for like an hour. It was fun. Uh, it was nice to see a couple of faces. Thank you so much, Ruth. Thank you for your insights um, and all of the case examples that you shared. And thank you to all the attendees on your engagement and participation this afternoon. We hope that you really truly enjoyed the session. Um, just a reminder for you, please register for our next webinar. It's titled Strange Bedfellows, the interplay between California and federal OSHA and OSHA's short-term agenda. It's scheduled for Thursday, August 13th from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. With that, have a great rest of the day.